too, is about to lie down in frustration. Uh, I've done a walk through the area where Karula was seen this morning. I found not evidence of one track. We're now on our own out here because everyone is running for the cheetah as fast as they can. <sighs> anyway, we're going to keep looking around here. I think it would be quite nice to see the queen. We haven't seen her for a little while. Uh, there were some guinea fowl there. They're now out of sight. Let's move a little bit further along. We might be able to get a view of the guinea fowl. At least I can show you something. There they are. You see them, David. Now, everybody, with this camera, you'll be able to make out two or three very small grey things moving away from us. There they are, guinea fowl. Hooray! Oh, very exciting, and we're about to get a real treat now. Keep watching. There we are. Wasn't that special, David? <laughs> very nice. Nissan pickup. Superb. A real classic. Let's carry on. There were some impala running around. There were also some waterbuck running around. Why they were running, we're not sure. So we're just going to keep fossicking around here and see if Karula hasn't uh, come into the area. She certainly, apparently, was stalking some impala today. So maybe she's killed. Maybe she's gone back to fetch the cubs. Uh, maybe she has not killed and has gone away again for a long time. But let's go around the corner and have a look. See. Now this is where Johann. Dan Hauser from Biffle's Hook saw Karula this morning somewhere around this area. And I was walking down all through there. I saw no evidence of her. There is a bird, a persistently calling grey go away bird, going wah, 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 indicating displeasure. Why it should be feeling displeasure? Well, that's anyone's guess. Now, it sounds like there are quite a few people trying to get into that cheetah sighting, so I'm not sure how long Byron's going to be able to be there. But it's just wonderful that we've had the time with him. I'm going to say we because I feel so part of it. Otherwise, I'll just be very jealous. Let's just drive in here. There's a little link road that goes to the top of the drainage line. Let's see if there's anything along here. Well, there's a Franklin eating some elephant dung. That's exciting. Oh, there's a bouncing stick. Oh, Karula. Why dost thou do this to me? Hello, Julia. What a lovely question from you about dispersal males. Please excuse my not looking you in the eye while I answer. I'm just trying to give, keep an eye out for uh, possible leopards, you know. Um, Julia, you want to know how they know when to start scent marking? It's uh, just the onset of hormones, you know, it's, uh, it's puberty. So when Sindile goes into puberty and he, you know, comes to a certain age, achieves a certain size, his body will produce a certain suite of hormones that will in turn allow him to start scent marking. Same with a lion. So they start exactly as the same. So, I mean, the best way to describe it, I suppose, would be to compare it with a, a male human being. You know how when a, uh, a male human being turns 18 or so, somewhere around there, he starts to assert himself physically. He tests himself first when he's 16 or 17 years old, normally gets the stuffing knocked out of him once or twice. And then, once he's big and strong, then he starts to assert his dominance. And that is precisely how it would work with a leopard or a lion. They'll sort of start tentatively marking territory, then they'll start to call, and then they'll probably get the stuffing knocked out of them once or twice by the dominant male leopard, or certainly be given a fright by him, and then they'll back off, and eventually they achieve the right sort of size at age five, and they achieve the right sort of level of maturity, and then it's, you know, they'll try and take a territory. That's how, they, that's how it works. This is where she was seen this morning. Like I say, it wasn't a very hot day, so I suspect if she didn't kill something here, she's probably pressed on elsewhere. 
It doesn't mean we're going to stop looking for everybody. Fear not. Well, I have to find something today other than one guinea fowl running away. Sorry, Davy, I'm going to really create consternation for you there if I try and turn around. So I walked up, down, through here. Nothing. Nothing's alarm calling. Everything is to complete peace. Right. Maybe we'll be lucky. My luck has not been with us the last few drives. That elephant was too spectacular. I can't, still can't believe it. I th swear I think he nearly slipped onto us there and got himself into a bit of a pickle when he realized he was going to either have to come within sort of two feet of us or he was going to have to climb over that... <laughs> he's going to have to climb over that worry, that gardenia bush. He's very disconcerted by that. All right, Byron has found more heartbeats. Let's go and have a look at them. We have just left those two cheetah. They, they were still lying down and resting. I think they may get up and move a little bit later. We decided that we would give some of the other people in the area a chance to go and have a look at them. We had such a lovely sighting of them out in the open. But we've come up to a clearing directly north just to open wounds and the reason for that again is they want the blood so that actually causes the wounds to stay open a little bit longer but in this case they are purely sitting on these impala to clean them and preen them and get rid of the ticks and the fleas that are sitting on them. It really is a lovely afternoon and they are beautiful views from these plains. All around us, nice open clearings. colors like what I've got on now. So generally speaking on a bush walk you'd want something around this color or a khaki color, brown color. Uh, the most importantly is as long as you've got comfortable shoes. That is very important on a bush walk. Comfortable shoes, water, hat, sunscreen and then, and then clothing that you will be comfortable in to walk for long periods of time. But color, I would try and stick to neutral colors especially on a bush walk. On a vehicle it's not as bad. You can basically wear anything. Why don't we carry on? I'm trying to head back towards a waterhole and see if we have anything coming down to drink. Naomi, I'm not sure if it is you that made the comment this morning about me indicating while I was on drive. We all had a very good laugh about that when we got back to cap. <laughs> My hand going to the indicator is pure, uh, just a, uh, what's the word? Um, instinct, just a natural reaction. You get so used to it when you're driving around the cities or at home. And even out here, my hand went and I thought, hang on, I don't have to indicate for anything. But we had a really good laugh about that. So nice to have this beautiful light now. I'm sure some of the other guests, if they, I saw some photographers on the other vehicles that were heading towards the cheetah. It's perfect light for photography if you've got keen photographers with you or if you are a keen photographer. This hour, we often refer to it as a golden hour, it's just beautiful light and it's great for natural lighting for photography. And especially for big cats.
elephants. There's a lot of elephant dung in these areas. This is all old elephant dung, but uh, I've definitely been moving through here. And that herd that we saw this earlier this afternoon, probably one of the herds that frequent this area. Scanning through these clearings as we are driving. So Tasha has asked an interesting question about the impala that we saw further back. Tasha would like to know why on their rump they have got those black coloration markings or the black marking around the rump. And Tasha, it's a very good question. Now the, the reason or the theory behind it, and I always say theory is because a lot of research has been done, but occasionally we're not 100% sure. I mean, this scientists have done studies on it and you know most most of the wildlife knowledge that we have we get from books and I'm almost certain that it is true but but I don't think that we are always a hundred percent certain with our theories uh, again this is the most plausible but the one is that those black markings around the rump attract the ticks and the fleas and that to that area it's a bit darker, it's a bit warmer, so that attracts the fleas and it is easier for the impala to turn around and, and groom themselves and get rid of those and preen themselves, get rid of the, um, oh, sorry, just groom, get rid of the, the ticks and the fleas. It's easier to reach with their teeth. So that is why that black marking is around the rump. It's a little bit on the edge of the rump, so they can reach there if they, if they need to don't have anything at the water hole at the moment so nice and still scanning around some more zebra tracks around here I think these zebras will come down and drink during the day, disappear into the, into the uh, thickets quite easily and, and with their camouflage, especially this time of year, they can disappear very easily. While we are driving around and heading to the next clearing or next area, let's head back to James and see if he finally has got any updates for us about Karula or lions. No, I've got nothing to tell you at all, everybody, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sometimes the drainage line here, and then we're going to head west, and I ha do believe... I do believe that there's a lion at the Arethusa Dam, so if you want to see it, have a look on the Arethusa Dam cam. We probably will head across there, actually. I wasn't going to, but we've got quite a lot of time left, and my own tracking skills seem to have deserted me entirely. So let's head across there, maybe. It will take a little while to get there, so we're just going to do a last pass through here. And we'll go and look at a lion that a viewer found us from somewhere overseas. Well done. Better than I've achieved today. Very pretty sun going down in front of us. It's not going to be a blindingly red or orange sunset because we've had so little cloud today. And I think we're in for another cold night. I've already put my jacket on. He's got his jacket on as well. There's a lovely smell in here that comes up. Yes, there we go. It's Malwati drainage line. Windy down. Hi, Lex. Afternoon, everybody. How are you? How are you? 
and hi again. So James still hasn't got any updates for you. That's very unfortunate. But I hear he is heading to a lion. So while he does that, while he's driving off to Arethusa, hopefully he has further luck. We haven't had any, any further luck yet. We just passed a vehicle full of guests and they are also heading off to go and view their cheetah. And it's very exciting when something like a cheetah is seen because it's not seen very often in these areas. You know, it is quite thick, especially this part of the Greater Kruger. You don't get a lot of cheetah activity. It's always fantastic and exciting to see them. So everyone in the area is hoping, hopefully going to get a good view. And again, I'm just really bumbling around here, not really sure which roads I'm on. Or <laughs> as far as I know, we are still on Cheetah Plains. And, uh, but it is, it, it's so exciting just to be able to drive and not really know where we are. And I don't know what's around ne the next corner. So I'm very much like you back home at the moment. I'm not sure what's going to come up or where we are going, but I'm just driving the vehicle. See quite a few more elephant tracks along the road. Um, and it's quite nice with the sun, even though it's difficult to drive into the sunset. And it's usually not ideal for, for when you do have guests, but occasionally it is unavoidable. But what happens is the sun shining off the road does shine onto the tracks and it becomes quite easily easier to see them. And I can just see the, the shine or the sheen of those elephant tracks coming off the off the sand. So Fox Hat from Surrey would like to know how far elephant can travel in a year. So Fox Hat, it's quite a it's a it's a difficult question to answer, and I'll tell you why. It does it all depends on the area, it depends where they are. He also asked if they migrate. So in Southern Africa, we don't have migrations like you see in East Africa. However, you will get seasonal movements depending on where food and water is available. And uh, in East Africa, they do migrate because the water in those areas will disappear completely. And those elephants will have to move and go and look for fresh water and fresh food in other areas. So they do migrate. Here they can cover huge distances. They're not territorial. So they will cover a distance, uh, especially in winter, if they need to go look for more food or more water, they can head out of the area completely. And here they could move from here all the way into the Kruger National Park, directly east of us. And they can cover huge distances, but they don't migrate like they do in East Africa, not down here. Is that a lapwing? No. Just trying to see if I can show you an interesting bird here quickly. Got the Cape Turtle Dove or the Ring Necked Dove over there. And then I heard some lap wings. Just trying to see where they are now. They are calling, but I do not see them. Have you got them? Uh, look at that VM. Where are they gone now? <laughs> uh, there they go. There we go. Look at that VM. Thank you. That is a blacksmith lapwing. And it's a beautiful black and white bird. Why I stopped to show you that is they are incredible little birds. They are ground nesting. And what happens is, often you have these large animals, and the blacksmith lapwings are usually around waterholes like this. 
but you can imagine being around a water hole you have a lot of animals coming down to drink especially the larger animals like the elephant and this is the water hole we saw the elephant at earlier or buffalo a lot of those big animals moving through you can imagine as a ground nesting bird that's quite frightening because you could have your nest stood on or definitely disturbed by these large animals moving through so these birds what they do is they lay very well camouflaged eggs on the ground but another thing they do and I've seen it a number of times if a big elephant or buffalo walk too close to the nest these birds start mobbing them they fly around and they come down and they dive bomb these huge animals and they chase them away it's incredible to see I've seen a lapwing on the ground uh, so, so we get the blacksmith lapwing and the, the crowned lapwing which are quite common in this area but I've seen a blacksmith lapwing standing on the ground with its wings open chirping and a buffalo walking up to it and it pecking the buffalo on the nose and chasing the buffalo away from its nest incredible to see Well, we're going to drive around a little bit further and see if we don't have any more luck with some other animals. While we do that, let's cross over to James and see if he's got that line at Arethusa. He's not on Arethusa, everybody, but he has found a heartbeat. Now, that is a remarkable achievement for me today. There is a kudu, albeit only mm, two-thirds of a kudu, the rest of him hiding behind a bush. Now, there are two kudu, in, in fact, there are a few of them in here, and a warthog. David, there's a warthog running through the bush there, terrifying the wits out of the kudu. Stop dead, you can see. Very nice picture there of the back end and the front end. <laughs> Here come the kudu out into the open, magnificent spiral horned antelope. The largest that we get here. I think they're rather splendid. And I always thought one of the most interesting things about kudu is that the males apparently live only half the length of time that the females do. And that's because they fight so much over ladies. Now, the females can live for up to 14 years. The males normally not longer than seven. And that's because they do fight, and also because of those big horns of theirs. Now, can you imagine? They're browsers, of course, so they live in thick bush. Can you imagine trying to get away from a lion chasing you through thick bush if you had horns like that? be almost impossible. So what they have to do is they run with their horns flat back against the back of their, their necks and it means that they can't really see where they're going which again I think is quite amusing. So they do get taken out quite a lot. That's so the theory goes. When I think practically though of how many kudu I've seen being eaten by lions I have to say it's not that many. Oh, Davy, if you just go, can you see the female there to the left-hand side? No, the left of that. There we are. She's looking very intently into the bush there, and she has been for the last little while. Now, if there was something there, she would alarm call, and it goes, oh, it's like a sort of oh, horse bark. But she's not doing that. Right, Byron's got some elephants. Apparently he'd like to show them to you immediately. So, James had a heartbeat, and I've got something with a much larger heartbeat. Look at this beautiful elephant bull. Nice big old bull. Just so graceful. There is a herd further down in the distance, further along the road. But this guy is magnificent. Look at that elephant swagger walking across. Not a worry in the world. He was very calm. Not worried about us. Oh, magnificent. Got very thick tusks. I did see a tip of his tusk 
had been broken off. And that often happens with elephant. So Gracie, aged eight, has sent us such a wonderful comment. She has said she loves elephant because the elephant always make her feel better and make her tummy feel good. Gracie, I agree. They make me happy too. I love elephant. I'm glad you too, you do too. And I hope you get an opportunity to see elephant in real life sometime soon again. Look at him wandering off. That is fantastic. What I'm going to do is just drive further down the road quickly. Let's go see what the rest of those elephants are doing and if it is in fact a whole herd down there. Viram and I have been very lucky this afternoon. We have been seeing, seeing quite a lot. How's that for a first trip to Cheetah Plains? <laughs> I must admit, I need to give James a bit of credit. He did recommend it. Again, the signal's a little bit tricky where we are at the moment. Viam, did you hear that last question? Do elephants sing? sing? Do elephants sing? Oh, and that was from Christine. Christine, I've never, I've never heard an elephant sing. I'm just trying to see. Can you see there? The light is a little bit tricky at the moment for you. We are looking directly into the sunlight. These just look like two younger elephant. Uh, let me see if I go a little bit further back, maybe. Let's hold it there, Viam. Let's see. A little bit better. There we go. So, Christine, no, I don't think elephants sing at all. They do vocalize and they do, um, and, and they, they can trumpet and make a very loud sound, but I don't think it's singing. Look at them feeding. They're using those trunks again. Those trunks are used for absolutely everything. question about the gland on the side of the head and if I can ex please explain it to her. So Kathy, that gland is known as the temporal gland, the temporal gland, temporal gland up on the side of the head. Now that gland, basically what it does is it secretes a lot of the excess hormones and testosterone, especially in the bulls. You do see females doing it too and that it's, it's all signs that, uh, that the, the, the hormones or the testosterone within these elephant is at a higher level and they start secreting from that gland. The bulls when they are in a stage known as must which is spelt M-U-S-T-H and it's apparently an Indian word must is the, the stage that the elephant bulls go into when they are looking to mate. So that is when they can be slightly temperamental. Their hormone levels are off the charts. A lot of testosterone. They're looking for the females and hoping to mate with them. And then they sweat profusely from the temporal glands. And also they secrete liquid from the penis. And you can see it running down the legs often. And they, they get a very pungent smell, very strong pungent smell. You can smell immediately if an elephant is in must. And generally, you try and give them a wide berth.
beautiful sunset too. This is really great. So nice to spend some time with elephant again. I think we're going to leave them now, let them carry on with their business of feeding. They'll constantly feed throughout the evening. They may stop and rest for periods of time, but they still need to feed constantly. Elephant definitely need a lot of food to keep those big bodies going. Let's continue. I just got an update about those cheetah. They have not moved at all. They're still lying out in the open, but we are being very kind this afternoon. We had a wonderful view of them, and we're giving some of the other people a chance to view them. Some of the guests in the area from the lodges around here. And I am now going to attempt to find my way back to Juma. I think it's that way. never know what else we could bump into though. We've been very fortunate this afternoon. Saw some zebra earlier. That herd of elephant drinking was fantastic. Lovely interaction. And to see them just in and around a waterhole is incredible. So while VM and I start making our way back towards Juma, cross over to James and see if he has got any more updates for you. Teeming, teeming herds everybody, teeming herds of dressage ponies with pyjamas on going running across the road. Here we go. Ah, oh, there we go. Sorry to terrify you, young zebra. We've come on to Arethusa. I've heard no updates about the male lion at the Arethusa Dam Camp, so we're just going to pull in there and see what we can find. Nobody wishes to talk with me on the radio. I think they're all sort of further north. Let's go a little bit further forward. There's another one on our left here. Twitching, twitching to get rid of the flies. You'll find many animals out here twitching away their skins, their ears, they're flicking their tails, trying to get rid of the flies, the endless flies. And you know, this year, while we watch exactly the reason why zebras are striped, you can see them moving through the woodland here, and the dimming light makes it very clear why they are stripy, I think. It has been astounding to me this winter how many mosquitoes have managed to somehow survive. It might just be in my particular room, but despite the cold, when I put, turn the light out at night, the over and abiding sound that I hear, other than the snoring of my very close neighbours, is that of mosquitoes. And it's very unusual. Oh, that zebra is way too old to be suckling. <laughs> and uh, apparently Chelsea in the final control, who is one of my neighbours, says she doesn't snore. Now, of course, I've never met anyone in the world who's ever admitted to snoring before. This is because you cannot hear yourself snore when you are asleep. Not so, David. Indeed. Ergo, it is impossible to say whether you snore or not. <laughs> I remember once... I'm, I'm fairly convinced that I do snore. Um, but I remember once hearing my, bro my brother snore when we were very little and we shared a room and I said, Douglas, you snore. He said, I don't. It's impossible. I said, well, how do you know? He said, I just know. That is a very large zebra to be suckling. just going to quickly talk on the radio. No, we didn't, I'm afraid. I did check that area extensively. I gave it a good walk around, didn't find even a track, so I'm afraid not. Chaps, I've left that area now. I'm just telling him about Karula. So, we've also got some impala wandering through the woodland here. 
and the sound of them wandering through the woodland at this time of the year completely different from the summertime. And we'll just give it a listen for a few moments. Isn't that nice? That's the sound, of course, of dry leaves. And that's a great advantage to these herbivores because it makes it that much more difficult for the carnivores and predators to walk through this area without breaking a leaf. And the hearing is so acute in the impala and the zebra and it's no accident that they're standing so close to each other. They will be using each other for security. And their hearing is so acute that were a leopard to be stalking one of them and standing on a cracked leaf or something like that, what they would do is unquestionably look that way and they would be alerted. Jacob, you're in London, uh, when my sister's in London, she says quite sunny there. I uh, don't know if you're a remainer or a, a departer, uh, but that will depend on your mood, I suppose, today. But you're on safari in Africa this evening and you want to know why there are so many impala. The answer to that is a simple one, believe it or not. There are many answers out here that aren't simple. That one is simple. There are so many impala because there is so much water around. Now, I know it looks like there's a drought, and there is a drought, but throughout the Kruger National Park, and especially in the Sabi Sands, all the landowners pump water, which means that you can actually not go more than two or three kilometers in any one direction and not hit water at some stage. Pieces of land here are pretty small, and that means that and every, everybody's got water on his land. And impala are tremendous grazing and browsing competitors if they can get enough water. In the Kruger Park, they can get absolutely enough water, and so there are just great swathes of impala where there used to be eland and sable and sometimes even roan. But because of the water, the impala and the zebra have outcompeted most of the other grazers, and that's why they're so much more rare. And you know, in the Sabi Sands in the early 60s, before the advent of artificial water holes in this area, they used to shoot sable antelope for rations. So that's how numerous they were. They were considered something of a pest. Then the water came, and then the impala took over. They also, I mean, they are a highly successful species anyway, and that's because they browse and they graze. They've got this astoundingly well-timed lambing season where they all lamb down within sort of two weeks of each other in November, which is an amazing skill that they have, amazing ability, and that does certainly contribute to their uh, numerousness. Numerousness, David, what is the uh, noun I'm looking for there? Their um, numerous nature, their numerosity, their um, numerity. Abundance. Abundance, much better word, thank you. We'll go with abundance, <laughs> as opposed to numerosity, which unquestionably is not a word. I'm try and get you a picture of what actually is a very red sun indeed. Oh, it's going to go down. Davy, there's a quick look at it, and then we'll drive a quickly fast, quickly fast to the driveway and see, that's your hand. There we are. See how red it is. Quite quickly, fast to the driveway, and you'll see we can't get a better view of it going down. <gasps> Hold on, here we go. That clicking that you can see on the on the picture, everybody, is something called, if I'm not mistaken, David, an ND filter. Now, what that does, of course, is just filter the light. And while it may seem like David is just pointing the camera and pressing go. Uh, there are enormous numbers of adjustments that he's making all the time and one of those of course is for the light. So if you stare straight at a piece of light, well, then you have to change all sorts of settings. There is a kudu there. I'm just going to try and get onto the airstrip and see if we can't see the last embers of the sun going down. But I fear me we might be a little bit late. Yes, I think we are. Anyway, we might be lucky at the very end. There's a nice high point at the northern end of the Arethusa airstrip, which is just down here. I haven't heard any further updates on 
that lion, so I don't know if he's still there, but we'll go and look. Because my luck today, he will have absconded about two minutes ago. He certainly will begin absconding somewhere fairly soon, as the darkness starts to fall. And now I'm just going to assume that he's a Birmingham boy. Three of the Birminghams apparently are on Buffalo's hook at the moment, and they've been feeding with three lionesses, supposedly of something called the Torchwood Pride. Now, I am a little skeptical of the Torchwood Pride's existence, to be honest, given that we never hear about them. And I suspect there was somebody asking today, where are the Shemungwe Pride? I don't. I wonder if they aren't members of the old Shemungwe Pride. But who knows? Lex and I were discussing it over a split pole fence today. He was in Gallagher camp and I was in the storeroom. And he, which is utterly irrelevant to any story, but, but he didn't know who those lions were either. It's strange the details one chooses to share every so often. Right, we're nearly on to the airstrip here. Let's see what's going on there. It's getting quite nippy, isn't it, Dave? Now, David, of course, is a, a little bit under the weather. He's got a little cold in his nose. And all over his body, I suspect. He is, uh, I said to him, have you taken anything for this? And he said to me, um, he said, yes, I've dosed up a bit. He then gave me a list of the things that he's taken. I'm surprised he's still standing, actually. I think he was taken enough to knock out a small elephant. Apparently, Byron has something to show you. Let's go across and see him. Enough about James's medication. Look at this. This is my favorite, favorite bird. A beautiful martial eagle. Wow, he is gorgeous. Look at that. Beautiful yellow eye. See that little crest on the back of his head. Very large, large head. Strong, powerful beak. And look at those talons. A little bit lower down. Look, perched beautifully on that branch. This is one of the largest eagles we have in the area. Uh, it is... Actually, now that I think about it, this is the largest eagle we have in this area, the Marshall Eagle. Very big, powerful, powerful eagle. And they will prey on something very interesting. Now, we get monitor lizards, very large lizard species in this area. We have uh, rock monitors and the water monitors. And these Marshall Eagles prey on those monitor lizards they specialize in hunting them then the reason why i find it so fascinating is because those look look how that head bends look at that the neck the eyesight is incredible it must have spotted something but anyway getting back to the monitor lizards why i think it is so fascinating is because these monitor lizards are so powerful and very thick skinned and they're large lizards they're not small at all very sharp claws, and these monitor, uh, these martial eagles are able to hunt them very easily. This is a great sighting. Wow, this is beautiful. They will also hunt other birds that they will, perhaps something like a guinea fowl or Franklin, that they can try and ambush and fly down and catch. But very expert hunters. So, Gerda has asked a question about the dry conditions we are experiencing at the moment. I wouldn't say it's quite a drought yet, Gerda. Um, and Gerda would like to know, do we see a change in the number of bird species and birds that we see when it is so dry? Well, Gerda, in winter we definitely see less birds because a lot of bird species migrate, migrate north for the summer. And so that will definitely cause the, the bird species and the number of birds to decrease. But the bird life generally, from what I have seen, 
does remain the same. Look at him perch right up on the top of that tree. But the bird life generally in these areas, there is still a little bit of water around and there will still be food for them. So the bird numbers, from what I have noticed, even in dry conditions, you still see a lot of birds around. But the number in winter and in the dry season does decrease from summer because you have a lot more migrants which come down for the summer. It's amazing, these, these large martial eagles can even hunt small antelope, like a young impala, or even, or even steenbok. So Amy, all the way from the United States, has asked if this eagle is as powerful as the bald eagle. Oh, look, there he goes. And off he goes, look at that. This eagle is definitely as powerful as the bald eagle which you get in the United States. It could even be more powerful. It is an incredibly powerful eagle, that martial eagle. So graceful and I'm so happy I got to show you it. As I said, it's my favorite bird by far. Just the, 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 the deep set eyes and that look on its face, it just looks like it's, it means business. It's a very serious bird but so, so beautiful. Wow, that was a treat. That was really, really great. Uh, we are on our way back towards Juma, just on the main access road at the moment. We've left Cheetah Plains and uh, We'll see what else we can find along the way. Let me stick some lights on here. While we are heading back towards Juma, I hope James has taken some of their medication so that he's not too grumpy when he gets back to the camp. Why don't you go have a look if he has an update for us. Man, so funny. <laughs> There's a hippopotamus over there. We've come to the Arethusa Dam, everybody. And the reason we came to the Arethusa Dam is because apparently there was a lion seen here on the Arethusa Dam cam. Now, that lion is either invisible to the naked eye and only visible through the dam cam, or he has walked off. And given the temperature, I suspect strongly that he's walked off. So if anybody did see him walk off, it would be most kind of you to tell me where he walked off to. That hippopotamus, of course, not alone. He has some friends you can see all around him in the form of about seven million catfish that are forming a sort of bed for him. Flapping about the place. Some of them will survive, of course, when it dries out. They'll go under the mud. They exude some sort of a, a slimy gel in which they stay relatively moist. I don't see any lion tracks on the road, but I mean, given my tracking skills today, it wouldn't surprise me if we'd driven over him. So if you do know where he was or where he went, please tweet us, hashtag safarilifequestions at wildearth.tv. I'm always amazed when I hear people read out terms and conditions, how fast they're able to do it. Anyway, this hippo is also not looking in the best of condition. You can see his hips are starting. Oh, he hasn't cleaned his teeth for a while either, has he, Davy? Mm -hmm. No. Ugh. That is awesome. Isn't that fantastic? Fantastic. You can just see the swizzling, swooshing. All of those things that look like sticks there, everybody, are catfish. Every single one of them. Some of them are at least three or four feet long. They won't be able to... I'm just listening. I heard what sounded like an alarm call. But we'll go and have a look-see. You'll also be able to hear the... I find very comforting sounds of a camp 
going into the evening. <laughs> Kimber Lion, you want to know if you think the catfish provide a sort of soothing massage for the hippopotamus? I imagine they do, you know. I think it must be. Once you're used to the feeling, once you've got over the feeling of those uh, slimy things flapping against your body, it's probably, you know, if you just sort of let yourself into it, it's probably quite pleasant. Like when you put your foot um, in, in the mud, in a, in a sort of coastal river estuary, and the fish start sort of swimming around. It's a little, little uncomfortable and disconcerting to start with, but after a while it becomes quite pleasant. There are also two or three African jacanas or lily trotter birds around. There's one coming just past the hippo there. You saw. There he is. And he or she, difficult to tell from here, will be just looking for little bit, little invertebrate snails, uh, possibly a little bit of algae, but largely snails, and maybe tadpoles if you can find them, but I don't think there are going to be many tadpoles in here. That's the last deep bit of water in this massive, massive water body. So definitely in for tough times here if you happen to be a hippopoptimus. I was just saying the comforting sounds of the camp, of course. These camps come to life round about now. Everybody sort of coming back from the staff village in their pristine service outfits. And I always found it such a lovely time in the camp when I wasn't out in the bush. Mm, Carolyn, very nice question, an obvious one, of course, which I possibly should have addressed initially. Uh, what or how do hippopotamus keep cool when there is no water? And the answer, Carolyn, is they don't. They have to have water. They can try and lie in the shade. Sometimes they try and lie in the shade, but they really have to have water to survive. They cannot survive out of water. And, you know, there are fairly large areas of the Kruger where the hippo have been dying, and uh, many hippo have died as a result of the lack of water around the place. So, yeah, they have to have water, Carolyn. So it's really a difficult time for them. And he's opened his mouth again. Here you can see his impressive nostrils. Look! Look at that! That is very cool, everybody. He's obviously a bit bored, he's scratching himself. He's been tickled by those catfish for too long. And Stephanie, you say, would the hippo eat the greens in the pond? Uh, yes, they do sometimes. It's not ideal forage. It's an exotic thing called the water hyacinth. And I have seen the hippo here eating it. But I don't think they do it out of choice. I think they do it more out of desperation than choice. They really do need grass. That's what they're designed to eat. But they will eat it in desperation, and I think... He's probably got to the stage where he eats quite a lot of it these days. You also find with a lot of plants that aren't necessarily supposed to be eaten by the, the animal, so if an animal starts to eat plants that it's not really supposed to eat. I'm just listening to... I don't know what... Oh, it is nice, never mind. I've just been listening to some jacanas, wondering what they were. Um, what you find is that eventually the sort of compounds in that plant which are its defensive mechanisms, which might not affect the animal trying to eat the plant initially, after a while, they do start to create a bit of a problem. And it's the same as if you eat too much of one thing, you start to not want that thing anymore, and that's your body's, it's not, it's not psychological, it's your body telling you that it's had enough of whatever is in there and it needs something else. And I think that would be much the case with the water hyacinth. I cannot believe how many catfish there are in there. It really is astounding.
There's a lioness at Juma Dam, everybody. That's very good news. So Byron's on his way there. I'm pretty sure it would have been one of the lionesses that we were trying to track this afternoon. Just my luck that Byron's going to see it. Thanks for that, Louise. Now I'm not going to have to listen to him complain about my lack of success today. Just listen here, Dave. Can you hear that bird? Mm. Screeching sound of what sounds like an owl. I'm going to go a little bit forward. You can still watch the hippo, because I think the hippo may well come out. So let's just keep watching the hippo, and I'm just going to see if I can see what this owl is making the noise. And Louise, I'm going to assume that no one has mentioned where the lion went. Tasha, what you saw there was that hippopotamus just uh, going to the loo, flapping his tail hither and yon. That's just what happens when they go to the loo. Normally they do it outside of the water, and that spreads the dung around, and it's their sort of um, territorial spraying. Now, you want to know if they can sleep under the water, and if so, how do they breathe? They can't sleep under the water. They would drown. What they do is they stand in sort of... Um, they will be in water that is maybe just slightly deeper than they are tall, and sometimes they'll doze off, sink to the bottom, and then they jump, they sort of push themselves off the bottom, up again, breathe out, sink down again, jump up, and they sort of doze like that. But I think if they truly are fast asleep, they go into water shallow enough that they can stand in it. There he's coming out. It's very nice to see. So, Louise, if you just won't, com please confirm to me whether or not anyone has mentioned the lion and where he went. So laboured they always look, but they are so fast when they want to be. But, I mean, you can see exactly where that incredible song, Mud, Glorious Mud, comes from. And you can imagine a hippopotamus singing it. Isn't that cool? Now look how deep the mud is that he's sinking into. So it might look like you could walk across there, but you would sink very deeply into that mud, as he is, and that's why he's walking so very slowly. And Mitch in New York, a very nice question, because we know that some animals do, do exactly what you've said. You said, do hippos ever get stuck in the mud and die from being stuck in the mud? I imagine it's happened, um, but I don't think it's common. I think it's probably very uncommon. They've got very splayed feet. You can see the splayed toe, toes there. That helps them not to sink in too deeply. Uh, they've got those short legs, so they don't, they, you know, if they sink all the way up to the edge of the elbow joint there in the front leg, their legs are so short that I imagine you can probably, they can probably pull them out if they have to. So unlike the impala or any of the antelope, which absolutely get stuck in mud like this, which have, they've got those sort of very sharp pointed hooves with very long legs, and if you get one of those stuck badly, it's very difficult to get it out and the hippo doesn't have that problem. Elephants get stuck in, in mud quite often, but normally just baby elephants. I think you'll find that hippo, because of their aquatic nature, are A, better adapted to it, and B, probably more capable of avoiding mud that's going to mire them. But you can see how gingerly he's walking. Very nice. Beautiful fellow. I'm trying to sex him. I'm pretty sure he's a male. I don't know if he's a he at all. He's definitely a male, isn't he, Dave? <laughs> Normally how it works. I think that is a bull. I'm pretty sure it's a bull. All right, let's leave him to go grazing off towards the lodge, and we'll continue back towards home. 
Isn't that a lovely picture? Beautiful. Right. Brother Byron has arrived at Juma Dam where the lion is sleeping. We've just got you, James. We've just got to Juma J uh, Dam. So let's see that lioness. I caught a glimpse of her. She's just walked down into the dam itself. I'm trying to get around there quickly. So glad you had such a nice sighting of that hippo. It's always fantastic to see a hippo yawning and displaying. Hang on, sorry, little bumpy here. Where is she? There we go, and we've got her, and we've got her just down in the dam below us. Let me just get the spotlight, there we go. Oh, beautiful. Full, full belly. I wonder which lioness this is. I'm glad she, I'm glad she drank so much water. Lions, oh, that lioness definitely, she looks pregnant almost with a belly like that. Sure, let me see if I can have a look. I can hear the impala alarm calling in the distance behind us. Oh, that is fantastic. Let's follow her a little bit. Oh, she does look pregnant, that lioness. You can see her teats and that belly is hanging quite low. It doesn't look like a, a belly which is full. Let's move a little bit closer, see where she goes. These lines are popping out all over the show at the moment. I don't want to push her away too much. Sure, she has got a, a full, full belly. Hopefully, full of cubs. Ah, oh, there we go. Maybe she just stood on a thorn. That does happen occasionally. Can hear the monkeys be behind us, alarm calling too. They haven't quite gone to sleep just yet. It's amazing how incredible their eyesight is. They can pick up predators from quite far away. It's always a good idea to go and investigate if you hear monkeys alarm calling. Let's carry on down here a little bit. Let's see where she's heading off to. Viam and I have been very lucky this afternoon. We have seen quite a lot. Uh, some earth moving equipment. I think they've been doing some maintenance on the dams here at Juma while it's dry and they're able to. But hang on, this lioness is coming out. There we go. Hang on, I think she might come out in front of us around around here. Let's just see. What a lovely sighting. This is interesting. And I mean, again, I don't know the blind dynamics in this area at the moment. This could be one of the Unkuhuma females. Unkuhuma females, I hope I'm saying that right. Um, I understand there are five of them, and they have split up a little bit because there's potentially cubs on the way. Amazing how quiet they are. Completely silent, but very happy to walk on the road. The reason for that is just it's purely a nice pathway for them. It's 
easier than going off into the bush through the thickets because they do see it as a, as a path in you know, her branches it's a little bit easier to move through I'm gonna start up and just follow her a little bit more Let's see which so Tasha has asked a question about that full belly which I was mentioning earlier Tasha I do think it is she is potentially pregnant and this this female does look pregnant those teats are very prominent and that belly is hanging very low so in my mind I, I mean it does look like she's possibly full too but that belly is hanging really low it does look like she's pregnant those are definitely the, the, the teats at the bottom look like they are full of milk at the moment and those do build up and get larger when the uh, when the females are pregnant. You can see, look underneath her belly there. Ah, oh, this female is definitely pregnant. That is very exciting. Very very exciting. Who knows? Very soon, you could have little lion cubs running around. And Tasha has just asked us another question. Um, if there are cubs, how many cubs would a lioness have? So Tasha, on average, well, it's generally anywhere between one and three cubs usually, or one and four cubs, but it's, on average, it's about two or three cubs. Uh, it does depend, but they can have up to four cubs. So one of the reasons why I think she is by herself is she's potentially looking for a den. And she's maybe left the rest of the pride fairly recently. And that could be why she's walking around. She just came down to, for, for a drink of water. She obviously still needs to drink. But she's perhaps in search of a den at the moment. A den site somewhere where it's safe. It's a well hidden Often they try and use rocky outcrops or thick drainage lines somewhere they can hide the cubs and will give birth to the cubs there and look after them for about a month and a half to two months before they probably introduce them to the rest of the pride. This is really fantastic. There she goes. You can hear a lot of nocturnal birds calling at the moment. Um, in the distance, there is a bronze winged corsa, which is calling. There are scops owls which have a beautiful call it's a very strange call but they'll call non-stop if they above your tent or room at night they can make quite a noise for most of the evening and it's a tiny owl it's only about the size of your hand very small but they've got a distinct call it sounds like they're going grr, grr, grr. and they will call like that constantly for 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 ages so and they're heading down into this drainage line now up ahead. But still sticking to the road. Again, just much easier for her to drive down. Oh, to drive. <laughs> to walk down into the drainage line. It's easy for us to follow and drive down here. Yeah. Goes. Stick with her a little bit longer. If she does move off into the thicket, I think we'll probably leave her 
I don't want to disturb her too much, especially if she is pregnant or, you know, and, and looking for a den site. Maybe if we're lucky, as I mentioned, she may decide to den on Juma, which would be wonderful. And then we will be able to get to see some cubs over the next few weeks or within the next few weeks once she brings them out of the den site. So Anna's asked a question about the lionesses and if they choose the den site before they give birth yes and i'm sure they will i think they will try and find an area the other thing is these lions because they are the territorial pride they know this area so well so this lioness probably knows or has an idea in her mind where she would like the den site to be uh, so she will definitely have chosen that beforehand and then when she feels she's ready to give birth she'll probably hang around that area and give birth to those cubs and then carry them. I think James has a bush baby for you. Quickly go have a look while we follow the lioness. We had a bush baby everybody. I'm afraid I think he's jumped off. He did an amazing display for us. There's another one. What's this one here? This one is somewhere off in here. There's another one in there. There. Can you see it there, Davy? Middle of the light. Um, up, up, yeah. Right there, he's in the middle of the light. Got him. There's one we watched, everybody, jumped, sort of leapt like a gummy bear, of course, between, I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 trees and came towards us and then disappeared as you came to us. Yeah, he's so well hidden there, that silver cluster leaf, isn't he? There, that's the other one calling. That's so unusual, you never hear them do that. Just in here, just behind this bush. Let me move a little bit forward. Come on, Wendy. There, 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 there. You see there, Dave? In the middle of the light. Um, <laughs> I've lost it now. It is there. Uh, there. You see it there? You're on it. It's right there. It's just almost impossible to see. There, you may just see the lights flicker, the ears, the eyes flicker. <laughs> but it's there, I promise. We go a little bit further forward. No, it's so hidden. We're not going to see it there, everyone. Let's go a little bit further forward to see if we can see the other one. There's the other one. was in one of these trees. But I think there. Yeah, no, hiding behind the branch. I don't think we're going to see it, I'm afraid. I'm just going to scan through these silver cluster leaf trees and see if there's another one. There doesn't seem to be. Right, Byron's still with the lioness. Let's go back to him. That's fantastic that you got to see a bush baby with James and to hear them calling. I, I have heard them before, but it's not something you hear very often. So I'm so glad you got to see and hear them. The lioness has continued along the road, still moving away from the Juma or Vuyatella waterhole. Oh, looks like she's heard or seen something up ahead. And 
I don't see anything, but their eyesight and their hearing is so much better than ours. She may have just heard something move through the bushes, could have been a scrub hair, anything. And she'll just pick up her ears and have a look and see what it is. They are so alert and so aware of what's going on around them. We, as people and as human beings, our senses are nowhere near what these animal senses are like. We really are quite useless out in the bush compared to all the animals that we, see, that we get here. So Monique in London has just asked us an interesting question about the lioness and with her being pregnant, is she able to still hunt for herself or does she go without food for a few days? You can see those teats again hanging very, very low. So Monique, lions have a very, very short gestation period. It's only about a hundred and ten 110 days, 100 to 110 days. So it's not very long. During that period though, and especially at this stage, that lioness can still move very quickly if she has to, and she can still hunt for herself. If she doesn't hunt, she won't. She, she probably won't survive um, very long and probably won't have a successful pregnancy. So they do still hunt for themselves, but once she has given birth, she may take a few days just to recoup, look after the young and and then go off and hunt again. Uh, often what they may also do is join the rest of the pride again and join the rest of the pride again and hopefully the other lionesses will be able to hunt and she will get food from them because of that. But she will still hunt. She has to eat. She has to be healthy so that she can look after her cubs. But it is a good question and it is amazing how these animals, even though they are pregnant, they are still able to hunt and look after themselves. So James Richard, good evening to you. James Richard has asked, what is the most unusual place that I have seen or heard of a lioness denning? I'm trying to think, James Richard. Um, uh, I, I mean, I've seen rocky outcrops, thick, dense uh, bush areas or drainage lines that, that are almost Im impossible to to get into unless you are a lioness. I am um, trying to think of any really unique places or strange places. Off the top of my head I can't think of any to be honest. I have heard of leopard denning under um, decks of lodges. So under wooden decks they have been known to go under there because they feel safe and secure. And I have heard of leopards denning under there. I haven't seen lionesses. I don't think lions are that comfortable with people being around, especially when they have cubs. Um, and it's also unusual for a leopard to den in an area like that. That is very unusual. So that would probably be, but again, not necessarily lions. I haven't heard of lions doing it. But right up on the top of rocky outcrops, uh, you know, that are not easy to get to. Lions going right up there to give birth to cubs. It's great that we're able to follow this lioness. But look how far she has walked already from drinking that water. Even though she's pregnant, she still covers huge distances. It just shows you, like, this afternoon, James didn't have luck, any luck in relocating those two lionesses that we had with that young buffalo calf kill. But, you know, they 
could have finished it and then needed to drink water and they will cover a huge distance to go and find water. Often, they, as I mentioned earlier, they do get moisture from the kill, but the blood in that is very salty, so the animals do get very thirsty after they are fed on a kill. They will then need to go for, for water and usually, majority of the time, these predators will go and look for water so that they're able to drink something after they have a kill. At times, if it's a very large kill, I just want to see what she's looking at. I don't see anything in the bushes here. So sometimes if it's a very large kill. Hang on, what has she seen? Again, she may have just heard something in the bushes. So as I was saying, if it's a very large kill, predators, and I have seen them, especially lions, they will be feeding, and after a day or so, they'll move. They'll start moving and they'll go. I th thought I heard something here. Hold on a second. Let me just have a look here. something crashing through the bushes. I'm not sure if it was perhaps a buffalo that she may have startled, that smelt her or saw and decided to turn and run. But there was definitely something large crashing through the bushes. I don't think it was an elephant. It did sound like a buffalo. I thought I heard a snort and a buffalo running off. But a lioness on her own, pregnant, chances of her hunting a buffalo by herself are very, very slim. So as I was saying, I've seen lions before feeding on something very large and then what they do is they go off and they'll go and drink at a nearby water hole and return. Often there will always be one staying close to that kill to protect it and prevent other predators from coming in and stealing it um, or feeding on it. Lions don't like sharing their food with anyone. Ellen or James has just mentioned it's so funny to watch she hasn't seen a lioness waddling like this before <laughs> it is funny I've seen I've seen big male lions waddling when they have fed on a buffalo and they'll so full their bellies literally like waddle from side to side just like this lioness but it is very funny to see Carry on following this line. It's just for a few more minutes while we've got the opportunity. It's really so special to be able to follow them like this. And we then have a better idea for tomorrow morning. Or just even if we don't look for her in the morning, just to see which direction she's heading in. So that in the next few days, we may come and investigate and see if we can't find any sign of her denning. See, even while she's walking, she, keep, she keeps looking left and right, still very, very alert, always listening and watching out for, for what she might bump into. Lions are very opportunistic. If they happen to bump into potential prey, they'll go for it immediately. I've seen lions feeding on a wildebeest, and another one came running past, and they all jumped up and ran after the other one and tried to chase it to kill it. And then they, they missed, unfortunately, but then they just re then returned back to the kill that they had. But it's incredible how opportunistic they are. Even though they've got food, they will still try their luck. Let's catch up to her a little bit. Just going to scan a little bit while we are driving. See if I don't see anything else around. Again, my multitasking being tested here.
Oh, the temperature has just dropped quite a bit as we've come down into this little drainage line. Temperature is much cooler it's because the cold air sinks down into these areas. It's heavier than warm air, so it's much colder down here. But the nice thing, and especially in winter, you get these wonderful smells down here now. You get a, a plant called a uh, potato bush. The potato bush has this beautiful smell. It smells just like baked potato. And when you drive through these drainage lines, if there is one close by in winter especially, you pick up on the you pick up on the on the smell very very easily and very quickly. Well, here we go. I think she's going to pop out here again. There she goes. Sticking to the road still just shows you she knows exactly where she's going. Just took a little shortcut through that this little kink in the road, but straight back onto the road again. This has been such an amazing afternoon. We've had the herd of elephant, we had the cheetah, we had lions, James had that wonderful hippo and some bush babies for you. And that lioness is now moving off the road so we are going to leave her and not disturb her anymore. I think we are going to say Good night from James and David. They are on their way back to Jumana. And a big thank you to everyone for all the questions this afternoon. I hope you have enjoyed it as much as I have. Uh, thank you to the ladies in the FC, Lou and Chelsea. Thank you to VM on camera for me today. It has been wonderful having you with us. Hope you've enjoyed it. And thank you to all the young viewers for your questions. Always great that you are watching. We will see you tomorrow morning bright and early on Safari Live.